Father, we thank you for your great forgiveness of us, and uh, thank you for your many mercies that are new every morning. We thank you uh, for your word uh, that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, and pray that uh, you would um, illumine us and give us ears to hear through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the words of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Well, I understand Heath Cross was with you last week and did a magnificent uh, job, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, Two weeks ago, for those of you that were here, you know that we concluded our series on appearances of Almighty God, and we did so by looking at Revelation 1 and the glorious, terrifying, encouraging uh, vision that God gave to the Apostle John as he was exiled on the island of Patmos. That vision was to be communicated immediately to seven churches, ultimately to all of us but immediately to seven churches that were arranged in a semicircular pattern, as it were, geographically, probably a a postal route of some sort. And the first letter was to be addressed to the uh, church in Ephesus, which uh, was a perfect place to begin because Ephesus was the primary city and the Ephesian church the primary church in the province. This church in Ephesus was born on Paul's second missionary journey where he stopped briefly long enough to connect with Aquila and Priscilla and the church was born. On his third missionary journey, Paul invested more time here than any other place he ever visited three years of his life where he preached the gospel, he delivered public lectures, he visited people in their homes, and under his leadership, the church grew and flourished and had a profound impact throughout the city, so much so that uh, the economy was threatened because the economy of the city was built around idolatry. Uh, If you remember Acts 18, 19, uh, Uh, The whole economy was built around the worship of Artemis or Diana. In fact, the temple of Artemis was uh, four times larger than the Parthenon and considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, And so the gospel collided head on with that idolatry. And eventually, if you remember Acts 19, a riot. (laughs) The gospel does these things. A, a riot developed in the city, and uh, a great number of the population rushed into the theater, which we know from archaeological discoveries uh, could accommodate somewhere between 17,000 and 25,000 people. And they filled that theater, and they had a pep rally. And as it were, with one voice, over and over again, they shouted, read it for yourself in Acts 19, Great is Artemis 
of the Ephesians. Years later, removed from that, those tumultuous days, the church was still alive and well, and the one who holds the angels, the stars in his hands, the one who is the king and head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, is pictured here as walking among these churches, offering a report card, as it were, an evaluation of their ministry. And so to the Ephesian church, he offers, first of all, a word of commendation. <clears throat> Verse 2, I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I think you would have enjoyed the Ephesian church. I think you might have attended the pastor's and choir's class. I think you might have cast your membership lot with this church because as I read, it appears to me that the Ephesian church was full of life, a veritable beehive of activity. He says, I know your works. He uses the word toil. I know your, your toil. Uh, my, my mind speculates that there was no problem securing volunteers to work in the nursery. Uh, no problem finding voices to sing in the choir. Uh, no problem finding greeters at the door or people to do refreshments or people to teach uh, Sunday school or vacation Bible school. They were willing to work and serve and even toil. Uh, do you remember George Crescheru? Any of you? Uh, George was, uh, or still is, uh, one of the custodians at uh, my former congregation. And I'll never forget uh, when George was new to the uh, custodial staff, uh, and frankly, fairly new to America. He'd come from Romania. Uh, we had vacation Bible school. And um, it was explained to George that rooms needed to be set up and cleaned up and chairs put up and taken down and so forth. And Vacation Bible school came and 250 or 300 children invaded and I didn't see too much of George that week. And um, following week, all was quiet. And one day George motioned to me and with this very sanctified scowl on his face, he said, Pastor Jim, vacation Bible school, no vacation. Never forget that. <laughs> not a vacation for George, not a vacation for teachers either, as many of you well know. But this church was willing to toil and not grow weary in well-doing. And moreover, they, they tested, uh, we find that word in verse 2, they tested those who called themselves apostles and are not. All over the world in those days, uh, People would show up uh, claiming to be prophets or teachers or apostles. And, and, uh, but this church was well-grounded. And in some way, they vetted these uh, teachers. And they didn't pass the test. And no doubt one of the reasons is precisely because the apostle Paul spent three years here. And they were very well taught and very well-grounded. And even Timothy was one of the leaders of this church. And apparently even the Apostle John himself made Ephesus at one point the center of his ministry, and likely even perhaps Onesimus. Remember the runaway slave who, who got converted? All these men had leadership roles in this church at one time or another. So it was an all-star cast. And so when some uh, man came to town and visited the church, and he claimed to have apostolic authority, these people were wise enough and mature enough and well-grounded enough to be able to vet them and test them and reject them. So we're talking about a strong church where people knew their doctrine, where people served and toiled. The report card's looking good so far. But then next we see a word of correction in verse 4. 
But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. All these good works they did, all this labor of love, all this doctrine they knew, all the good works they did, they did right things for the wrong reason. They did good things for bad reasons. Sometimes they may have done the best things for the worst reasons. You know, that's possible to do that. It really is very possible, and I think the devil likes that. Because the devil knows that in the end, the motive will win. And what today may be the right thing done for the wrong reason will eventually become the wrong thing done for the wrong reason. Now, people want to know, what, what love did they lose? What love had they abandoned? Was, is he talking about love for God? Was he talking about love for each other? I don't think it matters. Because there's no love for others that does not originate in love for God. And those who love God will always love God's people. And even those who are not God's people, even the unsaved, Because God's people want to see the unsaved saved and are just like him, desiring that all should repent, that none should perish, but all should come to everlasting life. But the point here is to be warned that it's possible, very possible, to do the right things, good things, for the wrong reasons. It's it's possible to be full of deeds of love and mercy. It's possible to know doctrine. Boy, is it possible to know doctrine and history, and polity, all these things for the wrong reason. You think about the letter Paul wrote to uh, the church in Ephesus. You know, in the second sentence of that letter, he talks about predestination. (laughs) He barely says hello, and he takes this church to deep water, talking about the deep things of God, something like predestination. So these were obviously very mature people and very knowledgeable people who knew their stuff and who did their stuff, but they lost their love for Christ somewhere along the way. In all the busyness and in all the knowledge, what does Paul say about knowledge elsewhere, but that knowledge puffs up. And they lost the love they first had. For the Lord Jesus Christ. And when that happens, invariably we lose love for each other as well. I came across a funny story uh, that illustrates the point, I believe, about two men, that, that uh, two strangers, and they met on a cruise. And the first man said, do you believe in God? And the second man said, uh, yes, I do. First man said, well, are you a Christian or a Jew? He said, I'm a Christian. First man said, that's great, me too. Uh, Are you Protestant or Catholic? He said, Protestant. Oh, me too, that's fantastic. Uh, What denomination? Uh, Baptist. Oh, me too. (laughs) Uh, Are you Northern Baptist or Southern Baptist? (laughs) Well, I'm Northern Baptist. Oh, me too. That's, that's great. Uh, Northern conservative Baptist or Northern moderate Baptist? I'm, I'm, I'm Northern conservative Baptist. <laughs> that's great. Me too. Are, are you uh, of the Northern conservative Baptist Great Lakes region or are you the Northern conservative Baptist Eastern region? Well, I'm, I'm Northern conservative Baptist Great Lakes region. Me too. Isn't this wonderful? Uh, just, just one more question. Are you of the Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region Council of 1879 or of the Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region of 1912? Oh, I'm, I'm of the Northern Conservative Baptist Great Lakes Region of 1912. Die, you heretic. <laughs> You get the point. I doubt the Ephesians were were that bad, but uh, I think we've all known people who made doctrine, even the finer points of doctrine, 
a premium. And this or that cause, uh, sort of non-negotiable things in life. And if we fail to embrace every one of those things, uh, we virtually are outcasts, uh, virtually labeled as heretics. The fact is Jesus Christ did not die for doctrine. And I believe we ought to know our doctrine. I believe we ought to study the word of God and, and be workmen who can uh, handle accurately the word of truth, as Paul says. And it's good to know history, and it's good to know politics, it's good to know all these things. But we, we know these things and use these things with a view to glorifying God. We, we teach, we learn, we grow, we serve, we toil because he first toiled for us, right? On that old rugged cross. And we must be motivated first and foremost by a love for him who first loved us. John Bunyan has two many characters, but two. One named uh, Valiant for Truth. And the other named Mr. Greatheart. And we should be both. Valiant for Truth. But large hearted in our benevolence for others. So as the Lord walked among these Ephesian believers, he offered a word of commendation. He offered a word of correction. Finally, a warning about the dire consequences if they didn't get the message. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. We all want our church to grow, don't we? We all want our church to have a profound uh, influence for good in the Stevens Valley area and beyond. We want to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world as we're called to be. But hear this. If we lose our first love, we'll lose our light. Whenever we lose the love, we'll eventually lose the light. And a church that loses its light isn't a church any longer. William Cooper is a well-known hymn writer. We, <clears throat> you may not know him, but you sing his hymns. Um, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. Oh, for a closer walk with God. The Trinity hymnal has uh, four stanzas from Oh, for a closer walk with God. But it leaves out a couple of stanzas that are really quite good. And we're going to sing them as we conclude our service this morning, but I want to read them to you first. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Where is the soul-refreshing view of Jesus and his word? And the other, what peaceful hours I once enjoyed. How sweet their memory still. They've left an aching void the world can never fill. I bet if we're honest, that resonates with a lot of us because particularly if we've been believers for a long time, it's so easy to get caught up in things and forget why we're Christians in the first place and how we became Christians in the first place and forget the beautiful simplicity of being able to sing, my Jesus, I love thee. And when we lose that love, invariably ministry becomes work and service becomes drudgery and burnout is just right around the corner. And we understand Cooper's words. Where is the blessedness I knew when first I saw the Lord? Are you familiar with Charlie Brown? I bet you're not. I'm talking about the Reverend Charlie Brown. <laughs> Reverend Charlie Brown <clears throat> May the 22nd, 1844, preached a sermon at the second ever General Assembly of the Free Church of Scotland. Any of you there? Didn't think so. He called the assembly to repentance, and God worked mightily through that sermon. Two days of humiliation, fasting, and prayer were appointed. I've been to some General Assemblies. Arch, you've been to some. Uh, not any quite like this, I don't think. One account said the whole vast multitude of men's heads were bowed 
and shaken like a forest of trees beneath a mighty wind. Another said that the delegates, quote, confessed in deep prostration the plagues of their own hearts and sins of their own lives. And in one universal cry, the prayer arose, God, be merciful to us sinners. We never witnessed a scene more solemnly sublime, and long after the sermon was done, no one moved. No one could move as the weeping and praying continued. And finally, the assembly reconvened and resolved the following, quote, with profound humiliation and in reliance on the great strength of Almighty God, solemnly to devote, dedicate, and consecrate anew themselves and their fellow laborers to the service of God and his holy purpose of glorifying his great name and saving souls with the preaching of the truth and the operation of the Holy Ghost. Horatius Bonar, another great hymn writer, was there, and he observed that revival had brought the church back to her chief work. All other discussions and church arrangements had to take a lower place as men gave themselves first to the real business of the church of Christ. Can you imagine how pleased God would have been with that Charlie Brown and that sermon and that general assembly? He was calling them to repent, calling them back to their first business, their first love, just as he was calling the Ephesians here and just as he is calling us as well. Peter, do you love me? We were supposed to have read that earlier. Peter, do you love me? Jim, David, saints of Stephen's Valley Church, do you love me? Have you abandoned that first love? Remember, repent, and return to the blessedness we knew when first we saw the Lord. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would restore that first love to us, all the joy and the peace and the tranquility and the assurance of your presence with us and your love for us, that we might love you afresh. Restore the joy of your great salvation, that we may serve and toil and labor and sing and give and preach and teach with ever joyful hearts, not growing weary and well-doing, but always refreshed by streams of living water, green pastures, that we may be always instant in season and out. Help us, Father, and bless us, Father, and Heal us, heal our sick, and befriend our lonely, and comfort our mourners, and use our missionaries, and prosper the ministry of our church, and provide for every need that we have, both individually and collectively, through Jesus Christ, our blessed Redeemer.